Hey guys, welcome back to the lab. In this week's video, we're going to be reviewing the hydrometer analysis. Now, just like last week that in the sieve analysis where we found the grain size distribution, the hydrometer analysis is also used to find the grain size distribution, but instead of coarse grain soil, we're going to be using our fine grain soil. So all that fun stuff that passed the 200 sieve that's too small to use a sieve on, uh, we use the hydrometer analysis to get that tail end of the grain size distribution curve. So the materials for this lab are pretty straightforward. Now, I have to make a correction. Last week's lab, I said we would be collecting every, everything that passed the number 40 C. Um, now, I did that because I wasn't sure if we'd have enough material of fines to use for this lab, but it turns out we do have enough material. So in this lab, we're only using soil that is passing the number 200 C. So everything smaller than 0 0.075 millimeters. Again, those are our silts and our clays. That is the soil we're gonna be using for this lab. So you can see it's pretty much like a powder, almost like flour, really, really fine stuff. And it's so small that we can't use a physical filter to separate the particles further. So to do that, we are using a hydrometer and again, in the other video, I, I pretty much said these are just fancy little bobbers and I'll show you what it looks like when it's floating here in a second. Um, we're going to need two graduated cylinders. These are both empty. One is going to have our slurry of soil in it. The other one is going to be used as a calibration and a cleaning apparatus for our hydrometer. The solution that we're gonna be using is 4% by mass sodium hexametaphosphate. Sodium hexametaphosphate is pretty much a very concentrated uh, dish soap. So it's used as a dispersing agent to make sure that all the clay particles and silt particles aren't flocculating together and they are separating and dispersed in our solution. We're going to need thermometer, of course, to measure the temperature of the water. And then we're also going to be using our jet air dispersion tube and hooking it up to the compressed air. And this is going to create our slurry and you make sure that the density of that slurry is consistent and well mixed throughout the whole graduated cylinder. Okay, so let's talk about what the hydrometer actually is. So this is it out of its case. It's a, a glass bobber with a calibrated density. And you can see on the stem itself, it has little numbers, little tick marks. Now these tick marks are our R values or our readings. These are the dimensionless values of our hydrometer. And these basically are telling us how high it's floating. You can see it starts at the top there at zero and then it goes down 10 all the way to 60. So if we put it in a solution, it will float. And because of the buoyancy differences between the solution that it's submerged in and then the actual density of the hydrometer, it should level out at a certain level. Now, if we change the density of the solution, that difference in buoyancy is going to be different and it'll be floating higher. Just like if you were in salt water and like the Dead Sea, if you ever had a chance to travel there, I don't know, maybe you have, <laughs> then you would know that since it's such a high, uh, salt content, the density of the water is higher and you can float better in the Dead Sea or a high salt water than you can in like a swimming pool or something. So the same concept is here. And again, what we're going to be doing is creating a slurry of soil mixture with our fines in this graduated cylinder. Now over time, the fines are going to settle out and they're going to start accumulating at the bottom. So it'll start with a higher density as all the fines are suspended in the solution, but over time, as the spines settle out, this density of the water will decrease. So as the density decreases, our bobber, or our hydrometer, will start to sink back down to its initial zero condition. So that's why we have to take a few zero corrections and meniscus corrections. So I don't know if we can see it on the camera or not, but we can try, but right now, if it's balancing, it is not at zero. 
it's not right at zero and it's going to be hard because of the refraction of the water but you can see that there's going to be a meniscus on the stem from where the glass is actually or the water is actually adhering to the glass but then also the zero is not going to be floating right at zero maybe you can see that maybe not so that's why we have to take a fm which is the meniscus correction which is probably just going to be one like a reading of one and then we also have to take our fz which is the baseline ca calculation which looks to be about one two three four four five so it looks like our fz is five so the first cylinder we need to prepare is going to just be a clear cylinder um, filled with 125 milliliters of 4% sodium hexametaphosphate. And again, this is our dispersing agent. And then after we fill it with 125 milliliters, we're just going to fill the rest up with tap water. So this is going to be the cylinder that we're using to take our baseline calibrations, but it's also going to be our cylinder that we take or that we use for our cleaning of our hydrometer in between tests. So think about what we're doing again. We're placing this in a slurry and over time the slurry is going to cement out or settle out, the fine particles are going to settle out. So if we left the hydrometer in there the whole time, there would be fines collecting on the bulb of our hydrometer. And that would subsequently change the density of our hydrometer, which would skew our results. So in between tests, we have to place it into this slurry, and then we'll do a little spin clean, and that would remove all the accumulated fines on our hydrometer. And then before we take our next reading on our slurry cylinder, we would move this back over and let it settle out and take the reading then. So the next step would be to prepare the cylinder that is actually going to hold the slurry of our soil. So we're going to use 50 grams of soil right there and it's measured out pretty precisely and we have to be very, very careful because again, this stuff is like powder or like a um, flower. So any, you know, blowing any type of like air movement, any like Hitting it may cause some of the powder to fly up in the air and we may lose our mass. So this is 50 grams. We have our second graduated cylinder. This one is full or empty and it doesn't have a spout, which is important. We have 125 milliliters of our dispersing agent. And then we have the rest just to fill it about two thirds of the way with just tap water. So we'll carefully pour our soil into our graduated cylinder. Now, of course, it's going to be really hard to get it perfectly. So, we did spill a little bit. Again, we as in I spilt a little bit. Um, so this fine content is going to be not in our mass calculation. So we're still going to assume this is 50 grams inside our cylinder, uh, but it may be a little less. So that could be a potential source of error. So now we fill up our soil and our cylinder with our 125 milliliters of dispersing agent. And then we're going to fill the remainder of it up about two thirds or a quarter of the way, um, just enough so we can use our jet air dispersion and it won't, um, and we'll have enough to create the slurry. We also want to make sure that any of the soil around the rim that may be stuck is all washed into the solution. The next step is to use our jet air dispersion to make sure that this solution is fully mixed. So you can see right now, there's a lot of accumulated fines at the bottom. And we want a full homogeneous density of our solution. So we want it to be all aerated and mixed together so that the density of the solution is full in the whole water column. So to do that, we use compressed air and this little device 
which will produce turbulence through these nozzles in the bottom and allowing this to mix for about five minutes, we're assuming that this is going to be a fully suspended solution. We'll then add more water and then do just one more agitation step before we can start taking our measurements. All right, it's been about five minutes. We're going to stop the dispersion here. And now this is an important step. We have to wash all of the sediment that is accumulated on our jet dispersion apparatus. We need to wash everything back into our solution here because if any material is stuck to this tube when we take it out, we're losing mass and that would skew our results. So we have our slurry now. This is our mixed slurry. We added uh, or filled it back up to 1,000 milliliters. This is our calibration with our hydrometer in. There's one more step. We have to place our stopper on to that one. We're going to invert it 30 times in one minute um, just to make sure it's still consistently mixed. And as soon as we're done, doing one last mix, we have to start our timer and start reading our hydrometer values. So it's gonna go by quick. We're going to take one, a reading at 15 seconds, we're gonna take one at 30 seconds, and then we're going to take one at one minute. After one minute, we'll move the hydrometer back into this one and then do the spin cleaning to make sure that no particles are sticking to our hydrometer. So once we are done flipping this upside down and once we're done agitating it, and once we put the hydrometer in this, we start our timer and then that will go for an hour and we have to take the incremental readings um, that you see in the, the procedures and on your table. One minute is up, so we're going to switch it over to this one. And we'll leave it in this one, the cleaning one, for about, you know, until about 20 seconds before our next reading. All right, so we've been running the hydrometer test now for about 60 minutes, taking intervals at the desired times. Um, you can see the bottom is getting a lot of uh, sedimentation. I remember the bigger particles are going to settle first, and that's how we can draw that grain size distribution from Stokes Law. Um, so generally, uh, you would still run this test for a little bit longer like just a little bit more, probably like two days more. <laughs> so it can be a really time consuming test. Um, I'm just gonna let it like sit and you can see, I mean, there's still a lot of sediment mixture in the slurry because it's still pretty opaque. Um, I'll come back and take probably a measurement uh, in one day 
maybe. Um, and um, also I'll have a couple pictures and videos of what it looks like after two days of settling and you can clearly see the layers of the sedimentation as they fall out of the mixture. So that should be enough data at least for our purposes to draw a good grain size distribution curve. Remember, you're going to be adding that grain size distribution curve to the sieve analysis grain size distribution curve, but make them separate data. So don't have them connect. Make them like a sieve analysis and hydrometer analysis and have them on the same axes, but different data. So if you need help doing that, let me know. Um, and as always, reach out if you have any questions on this lab. It's an interesting lab and it's pretty theoretical, but it's important because we still need to determine the grain size distribution when it comes to fine grain soils. 24 hours later. I wanted to show you guys what it looks like now after 24 hours. I came back on uh, the Sunday after here and um, you know there's still a lot of suspension right you can see there's a little bit more of a sediment pile on the bottom but I mean for the most part this the fluid is still uh, pretty suspended it's still pretty opaque um, you can see though let's see if it'll actually show it clearly we're at about 26 of a reading uh, so 24 hours ago it was 35 was the least um, so the density has changed a bit I mean, you can see uh, usually you'd run this for at least another more day to uh, try to allow a majority of the fines to settle. Uh, the other thing too, since we are taking it at a much further time uh, apart from our last reading, the temperature is going to cool down a little bit because it's been exposed to this like whole ambient room. Uh, so now we're at, instead of 21, we're at 20.8. So you'd have to account for that. So that's where that data is going to come from. So I'll give you this data still, um, just so you can get that full rounded curve. Um, but you can see it's still got some time to go. Um, so it's not going to be able to produce that full curve like you would normally do in a professional lab.